Can you hear me? Yes. Um, my name is Jennifer Reek. I'm a, uh, an American theologian and author. In my contribution to the book, um, I talk about women who, are on, who feel they are on the threshold of the church, where they feel uh, you know, they, they are neither fully in the church nor fully out of the church. Um, and I ask the questions, you know, can we be full disciples in the church? What is church? Um, and today, I'm, I'm so happy to be here and uh, with these four women from very different contexts, but yet um, this morning we had a, a conversation, and I hope we can replicate it here because it was quite lively. Um, and though we all have different experiences, there is much that we have. Uh, in common. So what I will do is um, introduce, uh, introduce them now and then um, we'll take turns, they'll take turns um, speaking briefly and then we'll have a conversation hopefully like the one we had this morning. Um, next to me is uh, Ursula Halligan. She is an Irish journalist. She came out in 2015 and is an active campaigner for LGBTQI and women's rights in Ireland. Uh, next to her is Celia Wexler. She is an American journalist, author of Catholic Women Confront Their Church, Stories of Hurt and Hope. Um, on the other side of me is Nintendo Hadebi. She is a South African theologian senior lecturer at St. Augustine College in Johannesburg. And on the end is Astrid Lobo Gajiwala. She is an Indian scientist. She has been a consultant to the Catholic Bishops Conference of India since 1992 and helped draft their gender policy and guidelines to deal with uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, so Celia is going to start off our uh, reflections. Can you hear me? Okay. Ready for a pop quiz? Who is the only prelate to be swiftly punished for his role in the child abuse crisis? The answer, Detroit Bishop Thomas Gumbleton. His mm -hmm. crime, he never abused anyone. He was a victim, molested by a priest when he was a boy. He disclosed what happened to him in testimony urging Ohio lawmakers to extend the statute of limitations for abuse crimes. Within days, Gumbleton was told he had broken an obscure canon law. A bishop must not publicly disagree with other bishops. Ohio bishops opposed the law Gumbleton endorsed. He did not mind the forced retirement as bishop but having to leave his parish broke his heart. The American Catholic Church has a bro culture far stronger than that of any fraternity. Many priests and prelates are unwilling or unable to think ill of their colleagues. Because they don't think much of women, they dismissed mothers' reports of child abuse. Because they think any priest can be salvaged with enough therapy, they send them off for treatment and then drop them elsewhere. Clericalism encourages priests to see themselves as special agents of the divine, but their special status is reinforced by a misogyny that limits the priesthood to celibate men and taints the church's judgments. Misogyny also skews what the church pays attention to. US bishops are obsessed with regulating women's sexual behavior. They've spent years trying to make abortion illegal. They could have better used their time as US nuns did, addressing the poverty that often leads women to end their pregnancies. Instead, the church censured the nuns for their so-called radical feminist ideas. The Pennsylvania grand jury report with its horrific details has led thousands of American Catholics to demand fundamental reform. But the scandals and sexism led me to write my book, Catholic Women Confront Their Church Stories of Hurt and Hope. I found exceptional Catholic women who would not let the institution's serious flaws drive them away from the faith they cherish 
They inspired me. They taught me that women in the pews must no longer be silent. Reform will happen only if we speak to one another and speak out. Even now, without access to ordination, women could hold more power. They could help seminaries assess candidates. Who better to read men's characters than women who have dated them? In every parish, women should be authorized to hear abuse complaints and then forward them to civil authorities. And that canon law Bishop Gumbleton broke, maybe the church should repeal it. Thanks. Thank you, Celia. Um, Ursula, would you like to go next, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm a cradle Catholic. I was born into an Ireland where the Catholic Church was the equivalent of God on earth. It was a blind obedience type of church, a pay, pray, and obey church. Then in the 1990s, the clerical child abuse revelations erupted and nothing was ever the same again. Irish Catholics were shocked by the abuse, but they were equally shocked to discover that their bishops, cardinals, and the Vatican had engaged in a cover-up of these crimes against children. Some were so angry, they left the church. Amazingly, the majority of Irish Catholics didn't leave. More than 75% of Irish people today still identify as Catholics. They didn't abandon their faith. They just ditched the institutional church. They stopped blindly obeying the institutional church as we have seen in recent referenda on same-sex marriage and on abortion. Now, I was angry too with the institutional church about abuse, but I was always angry with the church since I was a little girl about the way they treated women. And then in 2015, I became angry about the way they treated LGBT people. And that's because in that year, Ireland had a referendum on the same, on same sex marriage. And I came out in an article in the Irish Times. I was in my early 50s at the time. So I had a lot that I was angry about with the church. But you know what? I too found that I couldn't leave it. I discovered that I just believed that there was so much that was beautiful in the Catholic Church and in the institutional Catholic Church too, because there are so many wonderful people, priests and nuns, that I know in the institutional church. So I resolved to stay, but not to remain quiet, and that's because I believe it has been our silence and our failure to speak out in the past that has contributed to the dysfunction of the Catholic Church. I believe lay Catholics need to step up to the plate now and to insist upon reform and to push for a clean sweep of structures and personnel in the institutional church. Otherwise, we will be complicit in the harm that it is doing. And that's why I joined a reform group in Ireland, We Are Church. I believe Catherine of Siena got it right when she said, cry out with a thousand tongues, the world is rotten because of silence. I believe it's time now for all lay Catholics to cry out, to speak up, to speak out. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. <laughs> Nintendo, would you like to share? Uh, thank you very much. Um, about two weeks ago, we, you know, just sitting down, uh, switching on the television, there was a program about uh, sexual, the church sexual abuse scandal. Um, and one of the women who was speaking, she was speaking on behalf of a case that involved five children. Um, and apparently, as they explored the issue, it turned out that the priest responsible for the crime was somebody who was moved from Europe to Africa, which already started to push the buttons on many people because they said, this is another way in which Africa is being con contaminated. Uh, but then later on, the, uh, the cardinal, uh, you know, spoke to the press and said one of the reasons for this is allowing for same-sex love and relationships. So again, deflecting, uh, the, you know, the issues. And then it came out that, you know, even in the African context, the issues of sisters, religious sisters being abused by priests and lay women. Uh, so the, the, the headlines was, a can of worms is about to explode. And so, so these 
are the issues that are happening. And so this is something that cannot be hidden. And I want to just say three things, that this represents the ultimate betrayal, betrayal of the actual mission of Jesus. And just to continue the reading that we had this morning at Mass, where he talked about little children, but Jesus just gets so radical. No wonder they don't read him. He says, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you to have a great milestone were fastened around your neck and you are drowned in the depths of the sea. This is Jesus, so no wonder no one is consulting him. But we see how radical he is about these issues. And I think the key there is to say that it's a betrayal of Jesus because people get the impression that because the church claims to be speaking on behalf of Jesus, that what is going on is what Jesus will have rubber stamped. But I think this text reminds us that they ran away from him too. Um, and so when we're talking about betrayal, for me, it's so fundamental. Not only betrayal of the, you know, the, the, the mission and the ethos of the church, but betrayal of the laity, betrayal of the families, betrayal of society, because the church stands as the light and the salt. And when we, we betray the society in which we are in, it's a betrayal on so many levels that it demands a serious re response. Nothing to hide but to stand and to say, we, this is not us. And then the second betrayal, the, you know, the, the betrayal of the victims and the families. And then it's a revelation. It let us as if the curtains were open and we saw the dark side, the abyss that is in the church. It's a revelation of a culture that has evolved, a culture of silence, a culture of toxic brotherhood and solidarity that comes at the expense of children and women. It, it revealed to us some power structures that have evolved, and we're looking, and we're looking at this clericalism and whatever name that we are doing, there's something monstrous going on that needs attention. And, 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 and I think the sexual abuse was just, you know, a curtain that allowed us to look into the abyss. I felt like I was looking into an abyss. And I think we need to enter there. And then the reality then is to, like I said, the last point is the kairos. It is a kairos moment. And, and what should have done is that there should have been a total shutdown of every church, every seminary, everything that you do with Catholics and say, we are going on this. I think in the Old Testament, they would wear like sackcloth, you know, sackcloth and repentance so that, we, you know, there was no communal speaking. The bishops are a community, so if one does something wrong, they all are guilty. There should have been a communal outrage at every level to send a message that this is not acceptable. They, we don't want excuses. We don't want to be treated as if we can't think. They need to really take this seriously and speak with one voice and mourn and cry and commit themselves to a radical change. In fact, we have reached what we are calling a Kairos moment. And I'm using this uh, because in South Africa, that's what happened when the apartheid regime was destroying people. The church stood up and said, this is a Kairos moment. This is not a moment to debate anything. It is to make a stand, a radical stand to say that we need a prophetic theology. We need women, men, everyone speaking to say this is not us, not in our name. We need all kinds of hashtags to, be, to, to make sure that this message is totally unacceptable and that it demands a radical transformation that we've been talking about. It can no longer, you know, we can no longer move on with this kind of structure. Things have to change, and it opens up opportunities for all the voices, all the voices that have been marginalized, the laity, the exclusion of the laity, the exclusion of women. So we don't want to step into a church like that as women, as one of the previous speakers. We want a radical reconstruction. And I want to end with a prophetic voice that's from Isaiah 43, 19. And this is Yahweh speaking. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God is a God of new things. It's our imaginations that have been captured. We need to be dreaming. We need to be having visions of what a church looks like that doesn't look like anything that we know. Thank you. Thank you.
Amen. And Astrid, would you like to share? Hello, yes. Um, so the Indian church is in the midst of a scandal which has all the elements of what we are talking about today, power, abuse, and sexuality. In June this year, a 44-year-old nun who was a former superior general of her congregation filed a 114-page police complaint against a 54-year-old bishop who's the patron of her very young congregation. It's a diocesan congregation. She accused him of raping her 13 times over a period of two years. And before she made this complaint, actually for the past one year, she has been going from pillar to post in the church asking for justice. She has spoken to her parish priest, she has spoken to the metropolitan bishop, she um, has written letters to, uh, to um, the, the uh, Conference of uh, 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 Bishops of India. Uh, she has sent thanks to Chantal, who got us uh, a letter sent across also to um, uh, Pope Francis. She's written letters to the Curia. She has not received a single reply, okay? And the bishops in India have been, or were, totally silent. And then what happened was, um, so the, the only thing that she was told was, every time she mentioned it, was uh, she was uh, told only about canon law and protocol. So the protocol was that she is a, a, a nun which, who belongs to the Siro Malabar uh, rite, and she was told that Jalandhar Diocese, that is the diocese of the bishop, it belongs to the Latin rite, so she has to approach the Latin rite. When she approached the Latin rite bishops, she was told, that the bishops have no say in the matter. The only one who can take any action at all according to canon law is the nuncio. And the nuncio was very silent and in fact was away in Rome. So what happened? So normally I guess people would have kept quiet, but this woman filed a complaint, a police complaint. So now it became an official police investigation. And more interesting than that is after waiting and waiting for the church to say something and you know, with all that silence, Five sisters from her congregation who were supporting her uh, came out in a public protest and they protested outside the Kerala High Court. They were joined by sisters from other congregations, by priests, by a lot of concerned citizens and they were all there protesting and asking for the arrest of the bishop. Now um, there was a lot of public outrage, media coverage. And finally, more than two months after the complaint was filed, the bishop was finally arrested. But not before him actually doing everything possible to manipulate the investigation. He used the resources of the church, he used his authority as a bishop to get support, okay? But um, finally, like I said, because there was so much of public outrage, um, you know, he, he didn't succeed and um, um, he was finally arrested. So I just wanted to say that this case exposed a number of serious flaws in the Catholic Church. So first of all, you have the culture of silence when it comes to the issue of sexual abuse. It's there all over the world, and well, it's very much there in India too. Victims fear that they will not be believed, or worse, that they will be blamed for seducing an innocent man of God. And this happened in the case of this woman too. Um, not so many people were asking questions about what was the bishop doing, breaking his vow of celibacy 13 times. Instead, they were asking, why was this woman silent when it happened to her 13 times? Okay, mm. so you can see the split. Uh, then, of course, she was also accused that there was a rumor going around that actually she, was, she had a personal axe to grind against the bishop uh, because something to do with um, you know, her authority in the congregation. And so that was another rumor, again, character assassination, which we all know is very familiar in cases of rape. The church, the case has also brought, drawn attention to the loophole in canon law that allows bishops to avoid taking action against their fellow bishops. And what was surprising for so many of us was that 160 Indian bishops claimed that they were powerless and that they could not use their collective power to ask a fellow bishop to stand down. What's more, in India we have, um, as um, uh, Jennifer has already mentioned, we have guidelines, we have a policy, these are the guidelines to address sexual harassment in the workplace. And some of us naively thought that these guidelines would be used and much to our horror we discovered that they do not apply to the bishops. 
Uh, then, of course, we also saw the might of the bishops. So on one hand, they're powerless, but on the other hand, well, they're able to use all the resources of the, of the church for their own personal agendas, and also to, um, to demand the allegiance of their priests and, uh, you know, parishioners, so many of them who will, who will uh, their flock, who will follow the bishops blindly. And lastly, I think it threw uh, the spotlight on the subservience of women religious. You know, they're supposed to be obedient. And, um, uh, but you know what happens, and also on the whole question of the subservience of, of the pervasive clericalism in the church, which is there and you know, makes second class citizens of women. Besides this, there were two fundamental questions that also were, arra were raised. And one was the whole aspect of what does it mean to be church? The bishops, including the accused and their supporters, are regarded as the church, while the protesting nuns and their supporters were denounced as enemies of the church. A line is being drawn between those who believe that the church must have a prophetic voice demanding justice, not only in Indian society, but within the church, and those who believe that internal dissent and calling the church's leaders to account will only harm the church, especially in the current scenario. You know, in India, we're a very small minority. We're just, uh, Catholics would be about 1.6% of the, of the uh, population. And right now, we have a lot of right-wing groups who are uh, very strong, and there's a lot of anti-Christian um, uh, uh, climate right now. So the whole question, the whole uh, question for Catholics was, do we remain silent about abuse and harassment in the church in order to protect the image of the church, particularly in this kind of potentially hostile uh, society? Or do we speak out for the values of the gospel and seek to cure the church of its sickness, whatever the cost? And I'd like to just quote from, um, uh, you know, once the bishop was, was um, uh, arrested, the Kerala Conference of Bishops, they brought out a press statement. And just to show you what we're up against, so, so I'll just quote from their letter. Obviously, there is a concerted effort to bring in lawlessness within the church by destroying the discipline therein, obedience to authority and its unity. Whatever the reasons were, the fact that some priests and nuns agitating in the streets, giving occasion to the enemies of the church to attack the church and the church authorities, and to disdain even the sacraments has caused much pain to all who love the church. We hope that the members of the church and the public will recognize that their action was not in keeping with Christian values, rightful interests of the Catholic Church, and even of the statutes of their religious congregation. So I think, you know, what is happening now in the Indian Church is I think all of us are beginning to realize the, the wisdom of the words of Catherine of Siena. Uh, Ursula quoted her, and I'm quoting her again, very simply to say that we need to speak the truth in a million voices. It is silence that kills. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Astrid. Um, a number of themes have arisen in this panel and um, during the day, and also I would say at least in the, uh, in the US in the secular world, I, mean, I don't really make a distinction between sacred and secular, but um, you know, when I read the Pennsylvania grand jury report, I mean, it is so horrific, but there were also moments that um, I think were very hopeful and challenging um, um, and um, really quite incredible. They open that um, report by saying, we need you to hear this. Um, now this is a grand jury of ordinary people who work for two years um, reading you know, millions, probably millions of pages from archives in the diocese. And that was their emphasis. We need you to hear this. Um, the bishops need to take accountability. Um, and the church needs to self-reflect, needs self-reflection. Um, so I thought maybe uh, we could continue um, with, uh, with a conversation around that theme. Um, Astrid and I know Ursula um, and Celia talked this morning about there being a divide in the church. How do we reconcile that? Um, Ursula and Astrid um, and everyone has mentioned um, that you know, what is happening is against the gospel and against what church ought to be. So I would just open it up to uh, whomever would like to share. Well, let me start. And first of all, I want to join my uh, South African colleague to the barricades because, you know, she really, 
You go, sister. I mean, that was really important. Um, I, this kind of, I think that what's increasingly clear is that we are church, the laity are church, and nobody's going to give us that power. We have to take it. I don't mean, you know, that we're going to go out and, and do violence or anything, but we do have to find a way to talk to one another, to, to, to not wait for bishops to give us permission. And that's the difficult part. How do we continue these conversations? I often say I wrote my book to start a conversation, not necessarily a revolution, although maybe a revolution after the conversation, mm -hmm. but to really uh, in the parishes, at whatever local level there is, to talk to one another, to find people who believe the way we do, who will be able to say, I mean, if all the women who did service to the church struck, had a strike one day, the church would stock, stop. There would be nobody that priests depend on to make their breakfast, to be there to set up the <coughs> mass, to do the myriad things that they do. And but we have, to, we have to take this power. It's not going to be handed to us. I would, I, would, I would agree with you, Celia. And I just want to say that, you know, what this episode taught us in India was, well, um, the credibility of the bishops took a beating. And uh, so uh, people are less inclined to now uh, look at the authority of the bishops. The second thing that what happened here was people realized the, the power of uh, their own power. So when they came out, when they protested, uh, they were able to get uh, some form of justice. And I think this is important, that, they were, they, that people realized their power. I must tell you that one of the aftermaths of this uh, episode was that uh, one of the sisters from another congregation uh, was told by her vicar that, uh, because she had participated in the protest, she was told by her vicar that she would not be able to, um, you know, conduct her pastoral responsibilities like teaching catechism and Eucharistic minister, things like that. And her parishioners, okay, all got together and protested, and he had to take it back. So I think that's a good sign that people are you know, beginning to realize that if they stand up for what they really believe is true and right and according to the Gospels, that some sort of change will happen. And since this is coming out publicly, I think networks are also forming. I think we've already experienced this with Voices of Faith, Catholic Women Speak, the power of these networks. Of course, you all are international networks, but we're also looking at local ne networks which are now emerging. So I think this is a good sign. Um, I believe that the institutional church cannot reform itself, that it has to be lay Catholics that will do it. And I say that because although Jennifer quoted from the Pennsylvania report some words of hope that you must listen, the problem is there's no evidence. There's no evidence that the institutional church is listening. And I say that uh, a few weeks after Pope Francis came to Ireland and um, we all thought that abuse would be top of the Pope's agenda, but it wasn't. The Pope almost had to be browbeaten into meeting um, abuse survivors. And he eventually did have that meeting, but his arm had to be twisted to have it. And it was an extraordinary meeting because eight survivors met him in the, um, um, in the Papal Nuncio's home in, in Dublin. And the Pope was in this room on his own with eight survivors of abuse, and they gave it to him. They told him. And he said to one of them, and this is extraordinary, I couldn't believe that he said this to them, he said, he acknowledged everything, and he said, Jesus is knocking on the door, not from the outside to give us inspiration, he is knocking from within to get out of this church, which is full of corruption and filth. So I, 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 have, um, I have a lot of sympathy for Pope Francis, there's only so much that one person can do, um, but he can't do it on his own. Um, I think calling a, um, a Vatican III would be a way of doing it, or galvanizing the support of lay Catholics to get things moving. Yeah, um, yeah and also, you know, just uh, continue with my uh, fellow panelists, I just want to um, also add something that what happened was our parish priest, um, he, he wrote an article, a public uh, article, uh, confessing his own pain and I think that uh, you know began to shift people's minds 
uh, that, that the, you know, how are they feeling in this situation? And he put it out there, there was no effort to justify, no effort to, uh, but, but what happened is that it divided the priests themselves because they felt there was a betrayal. There's kind of like a toxic uh, solidarity um, that, that, that was going on there. But, but, uh, but I, I, just want, I just wanted to highlight that he did something that shifted you know, and uh, in my, I have a radio program, and I have my colleague here, Sheila from Radio Veritas. Um, I, I've begun all my program with a minute of silence to say, we will do this until we see a radical change in the sexual abuse scandal, because we are not afraid to face issues as they are, get into the abyss, because in there, that is where we will create something new, you know. So, so I, think, I think we need to be uh, drawing in uh, those priests that are uh, wanting to come out and, um, and to be in solidarity. So that even the whole divide between priests and laity, that this becomes an opportunity of really restructuring everything. Uh, and we cannot miss that opportunity. Um, I mean, we've talked a little bit about restructuring, but how, how do you restructure? I mean, we've, we've mentioned a few things, and I've seen, I mean, I've seen, I have seen that um, just recently, the school where I teach, we had a panel discussion um, about the abuse crisis, and we invited uh, the local community and students and faculty to attend, and over 150 people attended. I mean, we were actually quite surprised. And, um, you know, we, four of us spoke, uh, four faculty members, and then we opened it up to the audience, and afterward, um, many people came up to me and they said how grateful they were for the opportunity simply to listen to one another, to listen to us, to speak, to ask questions, and that they hoped that there would be, a, you know, it was that we had provided the space to have the conversation and maybe begin some kind of healing that made such a difference to them. And it seemed, you know, it seems like such a simple yet difficult thing. So, I mean, maybe if we could continue I, along I, those I, lines. I think Pope Francis gave us, he diagnosed the problem. He said that clericalism was at the root of it all. So the question is, what do we do about clericalism? Um, uh, as, as Chantal said earlier, I believe we have to dismantle clericalism. So how do we do that? Um, I, I believe we will have to, uh, to engage in dialogue with the bishops and, and our cardinals and the pope. And we will also have to engage in peaceful protests too, because when someone isn't listening, you have to, um, you have to make some noise. And Jesus, if you <laughs> read the Gospels, when he made people sit up and listen. And he said radical things. And I believe we, we need to do the same. And I think Pope Francis has diagnosed the problem. It is clericalism that is at the root of the problem. We need to dismantle the hierarchy because it perpetuates patriarchy, because it's built on bad theology. And I think really at the fundamental core of the problem that we're facing is a crisis of thinking. It's a crisis of really bad theology. And that's why we need education more than ever, and that's for me, for me personally, Catherine of Siena School has been marvelous because it has, it has helped me think things through. And I find most people don't have time to think. So we have a crisis of thinking in a church that has trained people to be servile, not to question. We need to break out of that mold. We need to think. Good thinking will help us get out of this trouble. So I, I, I just wanted to say that in, in this episode that happened, okay, the divide was an ideological divide. It was not a divide between the clergy and the lay people. So that was interesting because there were a lot of priests that supported the protest. And in fact, um, a very a strong group called, I think it was called Save Our Sisters, was uh, actually headed by a priest. And um, w one of the things now, for instance, um, We've been asked, when I go back, uh, the three of us women who've been asked to address the deanery, they have these deanery meetings every month where about 50 priests would come, the parish priests, and this is going to be the topic. So we are going to be talking about clergy sexual abuse, we're going to be talking about clericalism, and they have come to us and asked us, would we do this? So I think these are ways in which slowly the conversation will happen, because it's only when you convince, uh, 
I genuinely believe that you need to work together. So you have to convince the other people. I don't know how long it will take. But at the same time, in parallel, you also work outside. So you don't depend on, um, you know, just the change that's happening inside. I think you also, uh, as somebody said earlier, have to grasp the power that is yours and use it. But I think we're kind of running out of time. I can give you a couple of stats from the US church. In 1987, six out of 10 American Catholic women said that the faith was one of the crucial elements of their life. By 2011, that figure was 35%. We are losing the women who think who are leaders in the church, and they're not gonna come back. So I think, yes, it's great to have panel discussions, but it's gotta go a lot farther. And I'm not saying that anybody here is just saying we should be happy with panel discussions. But we're really at a crisis point. One thing I think the Pope could do that would be a great symbol is he could start the process to canonize Barbara Blaine. Barbara Blaine founded the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests. Um, she was abused herself. She died suddenly a couple of years ago. She was a, an incredible Christian, disappointed by bishops at every turn, lied to by American bishops at every turn. If the Pope would, would say, you know, we are going to consider the canonization of Barbara Blaine because it would send a signal that A, they take this seriously, and B, they are recognizing the sins of their colleagues. Um, and also even at the bishops, he's called all the bishops to come in February, that we would also invite ourselves. Um, <laughs> Um, how much time? Um, maybe if we each uh, conclude with something that um, you found most interesting in the discussion, how we might move forward as women. Um, I mean, one thought that occurred to me was, um, you know, Ursula has mentioned people walking away from the church. Um, what about leaving the church and starting a new church? <laughs> I don't want to do that. I think that would be failure because we've already had so many splits. It's, if, if we're people of faith, it's one God. We, we need to work together. And I, I want to work with my brothers and sisters in the institutional church. There are so many wonderful people in the institutional church. The problem is, at a certain level, women are not being heard. So to get our voices heard, we may need to make some noise. And uh, if it means inviting ourselves to the meeting in February, yes. But we need to be creative as well mm -hmm. in how we do it. Now, in Ireland, when the Pope came, um, I'm part of a reform group called We Are Church. And we weren't allowed to have a stand at the World Meeting of Families simply because we also support uh, the, the rights of LGBTI people. Um, so we, we, we were just excluded. So we're all for dialogue, but how can we talk to people when we're not even allowed into the room? And then they had a priest called Father James Martin talking inside the World Meeting of Families, telling other Catholics to be nice to LGBT people because, you know, they're human too. And we should treat them, you know, like other human beings. Mm -hmm. We were outside. I was outside with a choir singing um, something so deep inside and we are family as a protest. And um, I, I know Father James Martin meant well, but really, if he was on our side, wouldn't you think he'd be with us standing outside the world meeting of families? Um, I, oh. Um, I, one thing Ursula said I, that really resonated with me is that I hear so many young people say that that is one of the major reasons that they um, are walking away from the church is because of the exclusion of others. Um, oh. oh.
Come conclusione dei bellissimi interventi che abbiamo sentito in questo dibattito, io vorrei proporre che da questa nostra riunione uscisse un comunicato di solidarietà con la signora Collins, perché, eh, che ha dovuto dare le dimissioni dalla commissione degli abusi, dopo l'ho spiegato prima, non so se voi avete sentito, proprio perché aveva detto che non esiste un modo di denunciare i vescovi e che finché non si potevano denunciare i vescovi non esisteva un'istituzione specifica per denunciare i vescovi non si sarebbe potuto porre fine alla piaga degli abusi nessuno è stato solidale con lei è stata costretta a darle dimissioni e nessuno ha detto nulla Io, i giornali non hanno quasi neanche riportato bene la causa della sua Dimissione. Io penso che dalla nostra riunione, soprattutto dopo che voi avete parlato, potrebbe uscire un comunicato di solidarietà con quello che lei ha chiesto e che non ha avuto. Okay. Just translate very quickly. Uh, she's asking maybe um, from this panel and maybe from all of us that we come out with this one press release or whatever that we stand in solidarity with. Uh, Mary Collins, uh, so maybe that would be a, a first step mm. on behalf of women here. Yes. We have on our website already, we have a letter of solidarity, but we can reinforce, and journalists here, we are very happy as Catholic women speak to put all our voices and solidarity with what Mary Collins is doing. So, grazie. Mm. Okay, I just wanted to respond to Celia when I said that, you know, you have these dialogues. I'm not saying they're the only option. I'm just saying that we're working within the structure. So when you work within the structure, you make use of whatever avenues are open to you, but that doesn't stop you from working outside the structure. So I think they both go together, and I think perhaps more important is working outside the structure, like you said, being present at the Synod from outside. Yeah, and I yeah. think um, we were excluded from the you structure. are planning something, Kate is planning something for the Synod that's happening uh, right now in a few days. So uh, I think these are very important um, initiatives and they all go hand in hand. Mm, and um, yeah. as someone said, you need to be creative and make use of whatever avenues you have. But the fact is that many of us here have chosen to remain within the structure. That is, mm. You have the option of keeping your faith and walking away from the church and you have the option of keeping your faith and remaining within the church. So when you work within the church, unfortunately, we have these structures, so that's tough. Well, no, I, I, I would say that there's a third option that we can um, hold on to our faith, which is very important to all of us, but we can remain in the church and change it from within, because yeah. I do believe that anything is possible. If we, if we have hope, if we have Christian hope, I believe anything is possible, and if we're sincere and we work you know, with genuine intentions, that we can change from within the church mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And, um, something that um, Nintendo said um, was very striking, that, and that the sense that it's uh, Kairos, moment and I mean I see that in in the um, in the US in the secular world I mean the other day um, I mean the entire vote on the uh, justice Kavanaugh was changed because two women accosted him in the elevator mm -hmm. and uh, accosted Senator Flake in the elevator and he he stood up and said we need to delay this vote and investigate further mm -hmm. and it was because of these two two women mm -hmm. two women yeah and as they say it's, it, 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 they say it takes a village to raise a child but it takes a village to change anything because every person every every one of those interventions need to work together in a coordinated way so that we speak in, with one voice and creating even in the process of of, of, um, of, of, of resistance, we need to realize that we need to create a culture, a different culture, and let's not repeat the culture that is happening out there in the process of resistance, because we own, and we, we know it in African context where we, you overthrow a colonial government, but because you don't have a different imagination, you merely repeat. So in the process, we need to be using our imaginations to think about something that we've never even imagined before so that we don't repeat the kind of things that we see. Yeah. And I think that, uh, yeah. I think Sister Simone Campbell, who is a, a wonderful woman, uh, an activist in the United States, put it very well when she said, faith is bigger than the institution. Mm. Jesus is bigger than the institution. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this is a, you know, this is like the a most, uh, an epic like the time when the, the Protestant Reformation happened. So we're all kind of blessed to be part of this amazing history, but it's a little frightening as well. Yeah. I'm just taking up what Natanda said there about imagining. I believe that imagination is hugely important in what we are trying to do. We need to imagine the type of institutional church that we would like, because we do need structures, we do need an institution, we just don't need a patriarchal, um, clericalized structure. But it's really up to us to settle down and to work out what sort of structure we want, H how is it to work? So I think that's really one of the first tasks we have to do, because what we imagine becomes a reality. That's just the way things happen. So. We have a failure of imagination so far. We need to work on that. Okay, I think we're, feels like a good place to stop. Thank you. all our contributors this morning, I'm sure you'll agree with me that they've been amazingly disciplined in giving us an enormous wealth of insight and passion and wisdom and friendship without going a minute over time. I have never been to a conference where that's happened, but I guess I've never been to a conference where only women have been speaking. <laughs> I think that has to do more with women being easily terrified by authority figures than with women's capacity not to talk too much. They were all threatened severely if they went a minute over time. <laughs> so thank you all. It's wonderful.